I studied some history in school. Uh, then I went into the science stream and I did physics and chemistry and mathematics. Um, then I did journalism. My father was Gandhiji's youngest son, and he was, by the way, you know, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi also did many things in his life. When he was tried in 1922 in Ahmedabad after his first arrest in India, he described himself as a farmer and a weaver. Because in a court you have to describe who are you. But my understanding is that Gandhi was many things, but above all he was a journalist. In South Africa, Indian opinion. And he had it in several languages. As soon as he comes to India, uh, he starts Navajivan in Gujarati and Hindi and um, Young India in English. Then he has Harijan in the 30s, 40s. And till his dying day, he was sending material to Harijan newspaper. So he was commenting on current events. Of course, he was giving his suggestions to the people if they were willing to listen to him. So he was also he was also a journalist. So I, I and my father was the editor of the Hindustan Times. He was a journalist too. So I was planning to become a journalist. And then uh, this was in Edinburgh, Scotland. I went there as an apprentice to a newspaper that is still there called the Scotsman, published from Edinburgh. And there I ran into some people who uh, were associated with what used to be called moral rearmament in those days, M-R-A. And these were people from different nations, young people. Uh, I was actually a paying guest in a family. And these people, there was a man from Holland, a man from Switzerland. We were all living together, two, two or three in a room. I'm talking about 56. In those days in Edinburgh, if you wanted some heat, you had to insert some coins in the heater. That's how heat could come. There was no central heating. And some nights you didn't have enough coins, so you didn't have enough heat. Uh, but these people uh, inspired me. And they said that they were trying to live in such a way that they could contribute to a new world. And their theory was, you can't change the world if you don't change yourself. So this made a sense to me. I said, this is also what Gandhiji used to say. Gandhiji used to say, if you listen to the inner voice, the inner voice will tell you what you should do, what you should not do. Um, and I was, also I, then I went to a conference in America in 57, a year after I did my apprenticeship with a Scotsman. And I was there in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, with black and white Americans. At, I'm talking about 57, when blacks were not allowed to do much in Atlanta, Georgia, in the South. By the way, during that visit, I also visited, met Martin Luther King Jr., who was then very young. He was in 57, he was 26, 27 years old. He was only about six years older than me. Uh, and in Atlanta, Georgia, I went to a newspaper office to meet the editor, a man called Ralph McGill, well-known American journalist. And in his office, there was a photograph of my father, not of Gandhiji, but of my father, Devdas Gandhi. Because Ralph McGill had traveled to India, and he had met my father as a journalist, journalist to journalist, and there was a photograph taken. And in Ralph McGill's office, there was my father's photograph. This was unusual for me. I returned to where we were all staying. There was a telegram from Bombay that my father had had a serious heart attack. And I phoned, in those days, you had to make what was called a trunk call, or a long distance call. After some time, the phone call came through. And by the time it came through, my brother, two years younger than me, was on the phone, and he said my father had died. So I came to India. Uh, but I decided, and I was offered, uh, you know, the owners of the Hindustan Times, do you know who they are? 
Yes? What is your guess? Who owns the Hindustan Times? Hmm? Birla, yes. Ganshyam Das Birla was still living. I was only 22. And he offered me assistant editorship of Hindustan Times. Very great honor. But I, did, I said no. I said, I want to use my life to change the world by changing myself. This is what I'm going to do. So I tried to do that. And I did that for several years. And that is when, along with some friends and colleagues, I started the center in Panchagani in Maharashtra, Asia Plateau, which uh, she referred to, which is also an environmental ecological center. It's a beautiful place. There's some wonderful birds that come there. We uh, harvest water, we conserve water. It's environmentally friendly. But the purpose of that place is dialogue and conversation so we can together understand Indian society and change it. That is the broad aim. So I was doing that. And then my mother's father, Rajagopal Achad, died in 72. In 73, a committee of three or four, K. Santanam, T. Sadashivam. Sadashivam is famous as husband of Subhalakshmi. Famous Subhalakshmi is husband T. Sadashivam, who had newspapers like Kalki and Swarajya and so forth. So Sadashivam, K. Santanam, who was a well known Congress leader in the old days, then worked with Rajaji. And my Rajaji's son, my mother's brother, Siyanar Simon, they said, you write Rajaji's back. And Santanam Mama said something which, uh, he said, we know that you will not only write about Rajaji, but you will also be willing to criticize. That is why we want you to write. So I decided, all right, I will try. I'd never written anything before. I'd written some articles, newspapers, so, but not a serious book. So I wrote my Rajaji book. That was the first book I did. That is how I became solely a biographer. Then I became a historian. And I've written many books like that. One of my recent books was about Punjab. And which Punjab? Not India's state of Punjab, but undivided Punjab. See, those of you who are very young, you don't even know that there was one day a thing called undivided Punjab. It is a very large province. It's a huge province. And today, much of it, or a majority part, portion of it, is in Pakistan, <coughs> where also they speak Punjab. And in 1947, there were many killings in Delhi where I was growing up. I was 12 then. Suddenly, one day, you know, I was going to a school in Delhi. And I, school had many houses, uh, Ashoka House. Then there was an Akbar House. And for somehow, I was in Akbar House. But after the 1947 killings took place, one day to the next modern school said, no more Akbar House. So there were new houses, Gandhi House, Nehru House, Subhash House. All the Muslim boys in modern school vanished. And new boys came, Sikh and Hindu Punjabi boys from West Punjab. And of course, uh, my grandfather was killed in a few months thereafter. So 47, 48, when I was 12 or 13, was a traumatic period in my life. School, uh, Delhi changed. Delhi was, there were not many Punjabis those days in Delhi. Then Delhi became a Punjabi city of Hindus and Sikhs. Of course, many Muslims are still there, but many of them left. So much later, when I was reflecting on the killings of 47, I said, I want to understand not just the causes of partition immediately preceding 47, but the long history of Punjab. Why Muslim Sikhs, Hindus had this division for such a long time? So I studied and wrote a book called Punjab, a history from Aurangzeb to Mount Vat. Aurangzeb, 1707, he died. After he died, 
Mughal Empire retreated from many parts of India, including from Punjab. And there was a vacuum in Punjab. And who filled the vacuum? Historians, you should know. The Sikhs filled the vacuum. Uh, and the Sikhs were a minority. Muslims were number one in all of Punjab. Hindus were number two. Sikhs were number three. But Punjab was ruled by Sikhs. So one question I asked was, how come that the Sikhs ruled Punjab? But the Muslims, with the support of the Mughals, they might have succeeded. But anyway, Sikhs succeeded. So anyway, I wrote this history of Punjab, including the partition from 1707 to 1947. And it covered many very controversial events, including the partition, and, but before that also many controversial events. And I was sure that at least some Hindus will attack it, at least some Sikhs will attack it, and many Muslims will attack it. I was absolutely sure. To my surprise, almost everybody welcomed it. The Guru Nanak University in, um, the University in Amritsar gave me a, a, an honorary doctorate for it. And it, it's, it sold very well in India, but also in Pakistan. So then when uh, David Davidar, who is the publisher of Aleph, he's a Tamilian, uh, lives in Delhi, and uh, he first started the Penguin India division many years ago. Then now he started his own thing along with, in collaboration with Rupa, a big publishing house. It's called Aleph, A-L-E-P-H. He's published my Punjab book and some other books also. He published my books in Peng Penguin and then this. So he said to me, why don't you write the history of South India? Because after Nilakantha Shastri, nobody has written about South India as a whole. At first, I said, this is impossible for me. How can I do? Then I said, if somehow my Punjab book, people have appreciated, why should I attempt it? After all, my mother was a Tamilian. And I'd been many times to Kerala also. I traveled to her. I said, all right, even to educate myself, I want to stay. The story of South India from 17th century to today. That's how the, this book came to be written. And Professor Gurukal was very, and, and my strategy was, I will not spend years and years in so many archives. I will go to the best historians, tap their knowledge, and interview them. <laughs> and I went to many such people. Of course, I interviewed also many people. I did go to some archives. And um, so, and uh, by the time I was getting old also, I didn't know whether I would, it, it would be completed. Somehow it got done. And uh, only about six weeks ago, I had a angioplasty done, uh, and a big stent was inserted. I did not know whether I would manage to come and even see the book. Writing the book is one thing, but seeing the book is the next thing. That also has happened. So as I said, I am a very, very, very lucky man. But I also want to touch on what Gop Kumar had said. About politics and why do I do this and why do I did I go to politics? You know, I have. By the way, people think I've only contested two elections against Amethi. Then I guess uh, contested the, in 2014 on an AAP ticket in, in in Delhi. But I've also contested two other elections which people don't. All four I have lost. Uh, I, I regret only one was I think a foolish thing for me to do, but the other three I don't regret at all. And I contested those elections really because I felt that my heart, that I should do them, that it was my duty, that I could maybe play some useful role. Maybe I was mistaken my, in my impression, but that was genuinely the reason why I went, contested those. When I did that, I did not say that I will become now a full-time politician. Maybe I should have. I did not have that kind of uh, understanding of, or determination that I must somehow become a very successful politician. No, I thought that, you know, uh, when VP Singh came along, and at that time in the late 80s, 
So there were Rajiv Gandhi and there was the Beaufort thing, but there was also, the thing that troubled me the most was how Doordarshan was being used to only for government property. Since I was a journalist also by training, this offended me. Why should a national uh, media be used for party? So one of my passions was there should be absolutely independent national media, impartial. So that was one of the main reasons why I also accepted. Um, and uh, yes, I did, I did, you know, I had opposed the emergency. I had also brought out a journal called Himmat for many years from Bombay. Although it had this Hindustani name, Himmat was in the English language. It was widely read across India. I, we were forced to discontinue it because after normalcy came and glossy magazines came, so nobody wanted to pay money to read him. But for uh, 17 years, it was it continued, and it is still it is a very useful historical record. 17 years, a weekly magazine called him, which I was the chief editor. And uh, so uh, the media was interested interesting me. That is why I said I'll go into politics and try and see if I can do play some part to make the media independent. When uh, I decided to join VP Singh, join the Janata Dal, and then they put a very difficult question to me. They said, we want you to contest against Rajiv Gandhi. I, you know, I thought VP Singh was very popular in UP. There are many constituencies which he can win. Why doesn't he give me some good seat there? No, no, no. There is a wave. You are bound to win. You contest against Rajiv Gandhi, you are bound to win. And if you don't win, we will send you to the Rajya Sabha. Well, I did not win, although I put up a very good fight. Do you know who came third in that election? Rajiv Gandhi number one, Rajmohan Gandhi number two, but third was Kashira. Very great uh, leader of the Bhajan Samaj Party, but I got many more votes than Kashi. And uh, Rajiv Gandhi won fairly comfortably, but I put up a very good fight. Uh, so I said, now will they put me in the Rajya Sabha? By this time, even to meet VP Singh was not so easy. <laughs> he is now Prime Minister. Impossible even to reach him on the telephone. After some time, all right, yes. So he said to me on the phone one day, Ye Rajyapal kaisa rahega aapke liye? Will you be the governor? Says, no, I want to be in active uh, discussion of politics. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, no, yes, no. Then he said on the last day, there is a plane going to Lucknow. You go and you file your nomination in the, because I was sent from the UP Vidhan Sabha. Then a phone came, no, 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 wait, don't go. Then a phone came, all right, go. <laughs> so I went on the plane. When I arrived in the Lucknow State Vidhan Sabha, I learned for the first time that my name was sent not for a six-year term, but for the unexpired two-year portion of uh, Ajit Singh's term. Ajit Singh was in the Rajya Sabha, but he had now been elected to the Lok Sabha, so he had two years left. So I was to fill. At that time, I did not even know there was such a thing as, you know, two-year term. <laughs> That's how my Raj I, people think I was nominated. No, I was not nominated. I was elected to the Rajya Sabha but not for a six year. So I wanted to say all this to explain to you how I go from history writing to politics, elections, but all the time believing rightly or wrongly that I am obeying my inner voice. Maybe I'm deluded in my judgment, but this is honestly my motivation. And this is how I've also become, among other things, a historian. And I must say that I'm so happy to meet all of you. I've, and you know, I've written many biographies, not just of these very famous people, but some others also, less famous. 
And ideally, I'm so interested in each one of you. Ideally, I would love to sit down with each one of you and discover about you, your family, which part of Kerala you come from, what your dreams are, what your ambitions are, the stories of your lives, but that luck I may not have. But I want to say, uh, end these introductory remarks by saying that I do really believe that uh, in this difficult time in our country's history, very, very difficult time. By the way, you know, in Kerala you have one perspective, but in, in North India, things are very, very sad. This lynching that you have heard of. So when lynching, you know, 80 plus, uh, this uh, website called Quint, which publishes a map. It is a lynching map. Where the lynching took place, who was lynched, uh, name, they were Hindus, Muslims, Dalits, uh, all that. Many of them were Muslims. Um, and when lynchings take place and people report them, in many cases, the police investigates the allegation of beef. Was it correct that some cattle were killed? So entire police machinery is, was there some such thing? Not very little investigation of who killed the man. Should we go and find out who killed them? No. Was there beef? Was some cattle attacked? That is where the police is spending its time. And it looked so bad, but suddenly, in the last 10 days, things have changed. Who has changed? The people have changed. Because people have suffered on so many grounds. And now, at least for the time being, this beef business, this temple business, is not cutting any ice. Unemployment is an enormously high figure. Young people are not getting any jobs. And farmers are so desperately poor. So the tide seems to have turned to some extent, absolutely undreamt of. I mean, I, a few weeks ago, I was very, very sad. I was saying that, all right, if not my children, my grandchildren will one day see some change. Because can you imagine what uh, a man like me must feel, who has seen India becoming independent, who has seen Mahatma Gandhi when I was 12, spent a lot of time with him, who has seen Jawaharlal Nehru, who, who has written Jawa Sardar Vallabhai Patel's biography I wrote 30 years ago. It's still regarded as the most uh, complete biography of Vallabhai Patel. Uh, and I, I wrote it 30 years ago. His strong points, his weak points. Um, I've seen all that. Uh, and then to see what is happening now, and horrible things take place, and nobody comes and publicly rebukes. I, I mean, it's unbearable for me. Absolutely unbearable. This business of intimidation. Emergency was terrible, but what is happening in the last four or five years, state plus mobs, state plus street pressure. You have not seen it so much here, maybe, but please be aware, India is also your country. It is happening like that. Now there are some glimmerings of change, but still it's a very, very, uh, very tough road ahead. Uh, instead of speaking for three minutes, I've spoken for 20 minutes, forgive me. <laughs>